again i continue with the geometrical characterization with sub topics as chemical characterization though we have discussed how to determine ph tds that is total dissolved solids electrical conductivity of the soil solutions bod and cod sulfide and chloride contents then cation exchange capacity followed by pore solution sampling so most of the lecture today's lecture will be discuss will i'll try to cover most of the techniques used for pore solution sampling followed by most probably in the next lecture or if possible today i'll be talking about corrosion potential of soils sorption desorption continue with that followed by thermal characterization and electrical characterization this is just to remind you that the characterization is still going on and we are still stuck up with chemical characterization part now to start with ph determination this is the unit which is known as water quality analyzer and this water quality analyzer unit is connected to some electrodes these electrodes are basically glass calomel electrodes you must have used them also earlier for determining ph of the solution of soils the only thing is that uh, you have to prepare soil solutions with different liquid to solid ratios which is also known as l by s so depending upon different l by s ph values may change may not change truly speaking ph value should remain same for different l by s but it so happens if you keep on increasing more and more liquid into the solution ph may also alter because of more opportunity which oxides may get to react with water and sometimes when you are working with oxides in the materials which are amphoteric in nature which have dual you know behavior when they come in contact with water ph may definitely change now this instrument is a very good tool to determine ph of the soil solution essentially what you have to do is you have to prepare a soil solution corresponding to a liquid solid ratio and then filter out the liquid part and that liquid part is normally kept in this beaker the glass calomel electrode is dipped into this and then you can read out readings directly however you have to be very careful that ph normally gets influenced by the temperature so this instrument also records temperature simultaneously and normally at room temperature that is 25 degree centigrade the ph values are reported so you can apply the correction depending upon the values which you are obtaining if the temperature is not same as 25 degree you can use this water quality analyzer also for determining total dissolved solids which is an indicative of turbidity of the solution if you cannot use a uv spectrophotometer then this is also a good technique you can determine electrical conductivity of the solution of the soil corresponding to different l by s ratio and then ultimately electrical conductivity can also be linked with tds of the suspension in the material you can find out chemical oxygen demand as well as biological oxygen demand and based on these parameters you can again classify the soil and later on we will notice that these parameters are very handy in defining the corrosion potential of the soil mass so particularly ph and electrical conductivity and sometimes another word which is used as redox potential i'll be talking about that later on so this is a simple device to determine all these parameters at different liquid solid ratios now most of the time when you are working as a geotechnical engineer for site investigation your profession demands that you should understand what is the concentration of chloride and sulfide ions in the soil as well as in the ground water can you guess where these type of studies would be more useful or applicable that's right particularly near by the sea shores or to estimate in very gross terms what is the degree of contamination of the soil mass or the ground water particularly in bombay region when you are doing piling activities 
it is mandatory to understand what type of soils and what type of groundwater conductivity and chloride and sulfide concentrations are available and then what will happen suppose if I determine that the concentration is very high so what you should do then as a protective measure then you should use some sulfate resistant cements so this is where the sulfate resistant cement becomes mandatory and then you can also coat the piles by using some polymers or the resins or some epoxies so the normal practice is the pile should be protected against any corrosion due to water or soil which is having a very high concentration of chloride and sulfates so here the normal procedure is that uh, you take soil sample dissolve it in water and make a liquid solid ratio of 2 is to 1 that is l by s equal to 2 and we go for indirect uh, titration and that titration is done with the help of uh, ion exchange units which are known as indion easy test kits so these test kits are very useful basically this is an ion exchange resin and if you drop it in the solution of soil mass or soil solution the color changes so depending upon the number of drops which you have added to the solution of a particular resin you can find out roughly what is the concentration of chloride and sulfide ions in the soil mass so it's a sort of a titration technique very helpful for people who are working in field and those who want to estimate the what amount of chlorides and sulfides are present and this can also help you in determining what is the corrosion potential of the soil now in my previous lecture i had talked about the cation exchange capacity of the soil mass but i did not talk about the whole methodology of determination of CEC but you have noticed that CEC is a parameter on which lot of things depend in fact the entire property of the soil mass depends so with this in view I thought of covering the steps which are normally adopted for determining CEC of the soil mass basically what is CEC the classical definition is that this is the holding capacity of the soil of any contaminants or cations so that means this is an amount of cations a soil can hold easily now this is where I was using the term parking of the cations on the soil grains all right and all of you are aware by this time that CEC plays a very important role in soil contaminant interaction you can also put it as that this is the summation of exchangeable ions that is sodium ion potassium ion calcium ion and ferric or ferrous ions on the soil grains so factors affecting CEC are basically the charge carrying capacity of the soil now my question to you is how would you determine the charge carrying capacity of the soil we always assume that clays have negatively charged particles but then the question is how would you estimate that what is the amount of the charge which is available on the grains of the soil is there any method which comes to your mind there is a method known as zeta potential determination zeta potential z e t a <coughs> so essentially zeta potential describes how much charge is available on the surface of grains of the soil now if you go in these type of studies you can very easily answer the questions that why clays cannot be compacted beyond a certain limit so apart from a double layer formation because of the negatively charged particles you cannot put two particles together just because of the mechanical energy so there's a limitation of the compaction process but if you remember if you go for some inner energy principle and if you expose the soil mass to some other energy field particularly electric or electromagnetic then what happens this double layer of water surrounding the grains of the soil gets reduced and soils can be compacted very easily so based on this technique the genesis of electrokinetic remediation takes place 
or the consolidation which is accelerated due to electric field application. So, this is important factor that CEC gets influenced by the charge cap carrying capacity of the soil. I think you can notice this point that as the clay particles are negatively charged, when they come in contact with the cations, there is a sort of a neutralization of the charge on the surface, clear. So, this is the bond which is formed at the time of soil contaminant interaction. And rather than contaminant, if you are dealing only with water, then there is a dipole formation or a double layer formation of water. CEC will also depend upon the pH of the solution. So, on both sides of the pH equal to 7, that is acidic and basic environment, the soil exhibits active behavior. So, this part you may come across later on when I will talk about the influence of pH on the corrosion potentials of the soils. Ionic strength of the pore solution, the type of cations, the type of ions which are present in the pore solution will also influence the cation exchange capacity of the soil and of course, the presence of the salts. Now, there are two codes normally which are followed. One is IS2720 and the EPA SW846 which are followed to determine the CEC of the soil sample. Normally, we follow IS2720. So, the sample is first treated with the H2O2 and what it does? If you treat the sample as H2O2, it will remove the organic contents and boil thoroughly for 1 hour. So, this way you can get rid of all the organic contents which are present in the soil mass. You should notice here that why you want to do this type of treatment to the soil? If organic content is too much, the reactivity of the soil will be more or less? It will be less. That is one of the reasons why you cannot stabilize organic and marine soils. It is very difficult to, to stabilize them. You got the point. So, organic soils cannot be stabilized so easily. First of all, they themselves are not stable. Second is their bottom holding capacity is very high. So, even if you put the cement in them, what is going to happen? Cement will not get any water out of the soil to get cured and to form a bond because these soils will not release water so easily. So, this type of mechanism goes on. So, that is the reason that you have to remove organic contents from the soil to determine its real potential. So, the treated sample is oven dried with 5 gram and it is mixed with 50 ml of one normal sodium acetate solution with pH. 5. Now, this mixture is digested in a boiling water bath for 30 minutes with intermittent stirring and later centrifuge at a speed of 5000 to 6000 rpm for 15 minutes. The supernatant fluid or liquid is dis discarded and the sample settled at the bottom of the centrifuge tube is again treated with 50 ml of one normal sodium acetate. CS3COOH is acetic acid. So, CS3COONA is sodium acetate solution again with pH 5 and centrifuged. Repeat this process thrice so as to ensure exchange of calcium ions in the soil by sodium ions. So, this is the first step where you are replacing all the sodium ions with sorry calcium ions with sodium ions. Why? Because you are using sodium acetate solution. So, is the leaching of calcium ions out of the sample of the soil and all those calcium ions get replaced by sodium ions. <coughs> what we will have to do next is we will have to replace the sodium ions which are getting fixed on the soil by treating it with some other chemical. So, this is the first step of the process. Now, this sample is treated with one normal calcium chloride solution. So, this is where sodium is being replaced by calcium ions and is again digested and centrifuged. This process is repeated thrice so as to ensure exchange of sodium ions with calcium ions. Sangeeta is realizing that is a very tough task. 
most of the things require a lot of patience, as I say again and again. Now, this sample is again washed with sodium acetate. Why you are doing this now? You are trying to check whether further sodium can replace calcium or not. If not, your process is done. But if there is a change, your process is not done. You have to repeat the process again. So, this sample is treated again with 50 ml of one normal sodium acetate solution of PS7 and again digested in centrifuge. This operation is performed twice. The resulting supernatant from the last three steps is collected in 250 ml <coughs> volumetric flask and the concentration of calcium and present in the solution is determined using AAS that is atomic absorption spectrophotometer. Now, once you have done this, you can obtain CEC. So, CEC is milli equivalents per 100 gram which is defined as concentration of calcium ions or sodium ions micrograms per milliliter multiplied by 100 into volume of the extract into dilution that is L by S divided by equivalent weight of the cation into 1000 into weight of the soil in grams. <coughs> Just to give you some idea about what are the CECs of different minerals and I hope you will appreciate why some minerals are very active and why some minerals are not active, this table gives you a clear picture. If you find out the minerals by using XRD, X-ray diffraction technique, for monpolonite, the CEC is 18.6 and for kaolinite and elite, CEC comes out to be approximately 5. So, almost it is 3 to 4 times difference between the cation exchange capacity of the clays itself. All right. So, because kaolinite and elite itself is a clay and monmonite is also a clay mineral. But this is one of the reasons why water absorption capacity of monmonite is much more higher than kaolinite. But in classical geomechanics, we always say that what type of bonds are available in monmonite? The Van der Waal forces, is it not? So, because of Van der Waal forces, the water absorption capacity is more. That is where we have not talked about the chemical potential of the soil or chemical aspects of the material. So, by putting cation exchange capacity also in conjunction with the platelet theory, you can find out what would be the total potential of the soil towards its activity or reactivity with contaminants or the environment. Is this clear? Now, this CEC value can be utilized for further classification of the soil. So, this seems to be a very good tool if you want to differentiate between coarse grained soils and fine grained soils. And within fine grained soils also, you think or you imagine a situation where each mineral is specified with a CEC value. So, the moment you get the CEC value, you need not to go for even XRD analysis, which again is a very costly and expensive procedure. So, what you can do is you can abscribe this number and you can say that this soil has more predominance of monmonite and so on. So, this again seems to be a good classification scheme based on chemical composition of the soil mass. <coughs>